Join us on a road trip through the land of 10,000 lakes for an unforgettable tour around Voyagers National Park, delicious food, awesome campsites, beautiful waterfalls, and the start of the Mississippi River. We are in Minnesota, our 48th state. Are you excited? I am. It's good to be here. Only two left, North Dakota and Alaska. We got plenty more recommendations from all of you, so thank you, and we'll try to see as much as we can. First stop, Spam Museum. We parked our truck camper in downtown Austin and walked the short block to the entrance of the museum. Bacon Spam on a pretzel? Yes, please. Admission to the museum is free, and there was quite a bit of information to digest, including all the different flavors of Spam that I had no idea existed. Apparently, there's even a Spam Jam Festival in Hawaii. I was less surprised to find the world's first bacon-fueled motorcycle on display here. It was built with custom parts and accessories, including a Ducati frame with a Mercedes engine. According to a Spam Museum representative, the bike, Smells like bacon and sounds like a tractor. So we just learned that Hormel was actually pronounced Hormel because it was a German family and that's how they pronounced their name. So they said in town around here, you'll hear people pronouncing it as Hormel and not Hormel. Now I know there are quite a few ways to enjoy Spam, but making cookies with it has never been on my radar until now. And just like the end of an amusement park ride, we made our exit through the gift shop. Kind of disappointed they didn't have all the different varieties of Spam that they sell around the world because of production shortages right now, but I did get myself three cans that I've not tried before. Spicy bacon and turkey. Having spent more time than we expected at the Spam Museum, we decided to pop into the Cabela's to do some shopping and spend the night in a parking lot. Kate and I enjoy checking out the local Cabela's or Bass Pro Shops to see their collection of animals on display. This location had a very well put together display of wildlife in North America, which included polar bears and wolves. After a night at the local Cabela's, we packed up the camper and headed off for the Twin Cities. One of our oldest subscribers, Ron Howes, and his daughter Annie met us at Fiska Ethiopian Restaurant in St. Paul. Everything on the menu sounded great, so I went with the house specialty and an Ethiopian beer, my first. Our four top table quickly ran out of room as the giant plates of food arrived. I ordered the spiced lamb tips with injera, Ron ordered the chicken with injera, and Kate, well, she ordered the vegetable sampler with, you guessed it, injera. What's the verdict on your first experience having Ethiopian food? I'm stuffed. <laughs> You're stuffed. I cleaned my plate. You did. It, Kate left nothing on her plate. Definitely a type of food I want to go and have again. Yeah. And of course I enjoyed eating with my hands. <laughs> with our bellies full, we made our way to Annie's house, north of the Twin Cities. She and her family graciously offered their driveway for us to spend the night. Joe is asleep back at the camper. I decided to get up a little early and take advantage of this beautiful day in Minnesota and go for a walk around one of the many, many beautiful lakes out here. While Kate was on her five mile walk around the lake, I made coffee and enjoyed some quiet time to myself in the camper. Once she got back, we said our goodbyes and got on the road. The weather has been really nice in Minnesota, 50s and 60s during the day, but at night it's about mid-30s. Yeah, it's been getting chilly. So we've been running the furnace and uh, I think both of our tanks are about to be empty, so time to go refill our propane. The two onboard propane tanks are easy to remove and walk over to any propane refill station. We typically go to a tractor supply or feed store, but this place was the only option along our route. According to the employee, prices had just went up from $2.99 a gallon. I think this is the most we've ever paid for propane. $4.27. Between the two tanks, we paid around $13 for the refill. Kate made us wild salmon and mushrooms for lunch before heading to the interstate park to see glacial potholes and learn about how they were formed. 
There were many more potholes to check out, but we got back on the road to make our detour to Presque Isle, Wisconsin to hang with our friends Scott and Shirley. I'm being swarmed by flies. Well, you've got your protective suit on there, so you're pretty good. Our friend let me borrow his Bucky's onesie. I love this thing! We may have to get you one next time we go through a Bucky's. It's so comfy. So this is our buddy's property. And I love it here. Except for all the flies. Yes, but they're not biting yet, so not too bad. Oh, and there are beavers here. Yeah, there's a giant one standing in front of me. <laughs> Real beaver is in the lake. It was great catching up with our old friends for a few days and sharing some great meals together, including more broasted chicken, pan-fried walleye, and Scott even made a guest appearance on an episode of The Noodle Life. This is the noodle you picked out for this evening. These peppers right here give me the slight hint that it might be as spicy. If you love noodles as much as I do, be sure to check out my other channel on YouTube, The Noodle Life. As we left the peace and quiet of our friend's cabin in the woods, we made our way back into Minnesota to Duluth. The canal park area was pretty congested on a Sunday afternoon, so we drove across the bridge towards Park Point Recreation Area to get away from the crowds. We changed into our sandals and walked over to the beach so we could dip our toes in Lake Superior and relax by the water. Before leaving Duluth, we popped into a local laundromat to do a couple loads of laundry. With fresh sheets and clothes to get us through another few weeks, we made our way to Gooseberry Falls State Park to see the waterfalls. I probably would have driven right by this spot if I were traveling on my own, but I know how much Kate loves waterfalls and that made the stop worthwhile. Two waterfalls in one day! <laughs> With the sun going down and not wanting to pull into camp in the dark, we got back on the road and made our way to a National Forest campground for the night. The previous camper graciously left a pile of wood that I put to use and we enjoyed a relaxing evening by the fire. The next day, we checked out the river by our campsite and enjoyed the peaceful morning before packing up camp and hitting the road. As we made the drive towards Voyagers National Park, we stopped in Ely to check out the local shops. We've been to Ely on a Monday, which means a lot of places are closed. Coffee's not closed though. So I'm gonna make a cup for our drive to Voyagers. These Ethiopian beans are a light roast, which is what I prefer. And most of the time, I brew my coffee in a single cup pour over with precise measurements. If you want to learn more about how I make coffee and all the gear I use, visit our website, wertherussos.com and search for coffee. I hope your coffee is tasty. So far, so good. I'm curious to see what it tastes like once it cools down a little bit. Off to Voyagers. Off to Voyagers. Thank you. You're welcome. With a delicious cup of coffee in hand, we continued north to Voyagers National Park. Of course, we pulled over by the park sign to take our photo before making our way to the campground. With only a handful of campers, we had our pick of sights and ended up in a loop with no neighbors and a site that could fit multiple rigs. Kate and I have developed a good routine for setting up camp. She pops up the roof on our camper and gets everything inside sorted out, while I take care of things like gathering firewood and putting out our camp chairs. We walk down to the campground registration kiosk to pay for our site and to read over the campground rules. We were both surprised to read that our camping permit was good until 4 p.m. the next day. 
As we made the walk back to our site, we decided to take a hot shower and enjoy the afternoon relaxing among the trees. When the only campground amenity is a pit toilet and the hungry mosquitoes are out in full force, we are very glad to have the inside shower option. Since Minnesota is known for their wild rice, Kate made us a wild rice, pork, and wild mushroom stew for supper. Don't worry, this recipe will be in a cookbook, but you'll have to ask her when that will be published. The next morning, we woke up to a sunny day with an expected high in the mid 80s. Given how peaceful and quiet it was, we decided to pay for another night so we can enjoy our time at the campground and get some work done on our website. Oh, don't worry, I didn't forget about the Spam. Okay, so this is the turkey Spam. Cheers. Tastes like Spam. <laughs> Thank you. Enjoy. Spam salad with Chinese hot sauce. We packed up the next day and made our way to the visitor center. Since most of Voyager's National Park is only accessible by water, we decided to take a guided boat tour around the park. We were gonna rent a boat and go out, but after talking to some people that there are a lot of rocks, and most of the people who rent a boat and don't know what they're doing, like us, <laughs> usually end up hitting the rock, so we figured this would probably be the least expensive option to us to be able to see the most amount of stuff. Bill of Border Guide Service gave us an overview of our boat ride and to point it out some of the places we are going to check out in the park. Fortunately for us, the other people on the tour didn't show up, so we ended up with a private tour of the park and an adorable Irish setter puppy as the co-captain. First stop, Ellsworth Rock Garden. We spent 20 minutes walking around the garden that was started by Mr. and Mrs. Ellsworth. There were toilets, picnic tables, and even a fire ring where visitors could hang out and enjoy the island. The garden really wasn't my thing, but Kate had a good time checking out all the animal-shaped rocks. We hopped back in the boat and headed to our next stop, I.W. Stevens Island. Without the aid of any power tools, Stevens built a house, three cabins, a sauna, and several other structures on this island. According to the interpretive sign, the man celebrated his 39th year of living here by piling wood all day. Next stop, Kettle Falls. Getting here required navigating the narrows and avoiding submerged rocks. I am so glad we splurged for the tour with Bill. Yes, well worth the money. Plus, we can stop at the bar, have a beer, and we don't have to drive. It turned out to be the ideal afternoon for a boat ride around the lake. The temperature was in the mid-70s, the sky was partly cloudy, and no bugs bothered us while cruising out on the water. Voyagers is now high on my list as one of my favorite national parks, making me rethink the idea of traveling around in a boat especially if we have a four-legged companion along for the ride. The next day, we drove to Bemidji to visit with Paul Bunyan and Babe the Blue Ox. Unfortunately, part of the display was fenced off because Paul's right arm had recently been broken and was waiting to be repaired. We went for a walk around the downtown area and ended up at Bemidji Woolen Mills, where we met the owner, Bill, who gave us a tour of the factory. Bill showed us some of the noteworthy garments they've made throughout the years and the well-known people who wore them. We also got a chance to see some of the machines they used to make their wool coats, including this old school buttonhole machine that changed the garment industry. After our tour with Bill, we went on a mini shopping spree. Yes, Kate even bought something. Shocking, I know. Apparently, these mittens made from secondhand wool sweaters were the perfect fit and she just had to have them. We also bought our very first wool blanket, which came in handy that night. With our newly acquired wool products in hand, we walked back to our camper and made our way to Lake Itasca State Park. 
The parking lot of the Mary Gibbs Mississippi Headwater Center was empty when we arrived. Maybe it was the rain, but we had the entire place to ourselves as we made the 800-foot walk to the start of the Mississippi River. According to the interpretive signs, it takes about 90 days for the water to flow from this point to the Gulf of Mexico. There is still so much more left to see and do in Minnesota, we can't wait to come back to the land of 10,000 lakes. The start of the Mississippi River is the end of this video. Thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed this, please give it a thumbs up. Subscribe if you haven't already. And if you want to see more cool content, head on over to our website at we'rtherussos.com. And we'll see you down in the Gulf.